Number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. So, sir, you blame the last administration, but is your messaging and saying that these children are and will be allowed to stay in this country and work their way through this process encouraging families like Joseph's to come? Well, look. <laughs> the idea that I'm going to say, which I would never do, if an unaccompanied child ends up at the border, we're just going to let him starve to death and stay on the other side. No previous administration did that either, except Trump. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. President Biden in his first formal news conference 65 days into taking office, pressed by our Cecilia Vega on the border crisis and the conditions for thousands of unaccompanied minors, many sleeping on the floor of makeshift facilities. Biden calls the situation totally unacceptable. What else he was and wasn't asked about today. Breaking news, tornado emergency as the South and parts of the Midwest brace for severe weather tonight. Seven states on watch. The National Weather Service in Birmingham, Alabama, is urging residents not to wait for the last minute and to take cover now. Reports of damage already coming in as our Ginger Z brings us the latest. News tonight in the fight against the virus. Pfizer expands its vaccine trial to include younger children. Why researchers are calling it a critical next step toward herd immunity. And a look at so-called vaccine passports and what's being discussed as more Americans look to travel. The suspect charged with shooting and killing 10 people at a Colorado supermarket in front of cameras today for the first time since he was escorted limping from the scene, half naked and bloody. The suspect now in a wheelchair, why the defense is asking for more time. One of the best known orders of the Catholic Church, the Jesuits, making a $100 million pledge to the descendants of enslaved people they once profited from. Tonight, one small step toward atonement. It's forming a partnership that we hope models the kind of truth and reconciliation we need as a country. But there will be some folks knowing that the Jesuits knew of the history, that why these talks are just now, just now happening. And in the battle against climate change, we take a look at why a lot of insects, like these cicadas that only emerge every 17 years, are needed for the health of the planet. It is a spectacle. Uh, there really isn't any other thing you can say about it. It's quite a spectacle. It's, it's one of the natural wonders of the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. With the president dealing with a growing number of challenges, from a rise in gun violence to racist attacks against Asian Americans to an emergency at the border, he held his first press conference since taking office and looming large over all of it, the pandemic. Before taking questions, Biden did express optimism about the vaccine rollout, pledging to double his initial goal of 100 million doses in 100 days to 200 million. But none of the questions directed at the president President today were about the pandemic. When asked about the two mass shootings in as many weeks, Biden did not have an answer for what should come next. Our Cecilia Vega pressed him on the border emergency and about whether he thought that the crowding at the border facilities is unacceptable. Cecilia Vega leads us off tonight from the White House. 65 days into his administration, President Biden walking out to face reporters for his first press conference, and it was the emergency at the southern border now threatening to overshadow his agenda that dominated. The questions striking a nerve. The Customs and Border Protection Facility in Donna, Texas, I was there, is at 1,556% capacity yep. right now with mostly unaccompanied minors. There are kids that are sleeping on floors. They are packed into these pods. What is your reaction to these images that have come out from that particular facility? Is what's happening inside acceptable to you? Uh, that's a serious question, right? <laughs> is it acceptable to me? Come on. That's why we're going to be moving a thousand of those kids out quickly. That is totally unacceptable. 
Tonight, there are some 16,000 unaccompanied migrant children now in U.S. custody, a near record. We spoke to migrants at the border, like nine-year-old Josel, who made the long journey from Honduras without his parents. The phone number for his grandfather in North Carolina, written on that pink hat. This is the number of your father, right? This is his grandfather's phone number. Many of those migrants said they made that dangerous journey north because they believed it would be easier now. Sir, you blame the last administration, but is your messaging and saying that these children are and will be allowed to stay in this country and work their way through this process, encouraging families like Joseph's to come? The idea that I'm going to say, which I would never do, that if an unaccompanied child ends up at the border, we're just going to let them starve to death and stay on the other side. No previous administration did that either, except Trump. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. The other urgent crisis, those two mass shootings in the span of a week, 18 lives lost. But facing the political reality that with the 50-50 split in the Senate, his party does not have the votes to pass sweeping gun control legislation, the president issuing this warning to Republicans, signaling he could back changing rules in the Senate to push his agenda through. We're going to get a lot done. And if we have to, if there's complete lockdown and chaos as a consequence of the filibuster, then we'll have to go beyond what I'm talking about. Cecilia Vega joins us now from the White House. Cecilia, your question there on the conditions at some of the border facilities clearly striking a nerve. And the president was also asked about transparency and access for the media to see these facilities firsthand, something that you certainly have been pressing for. Yeah, uh, repeatedly, Lindsay, we've been denied more than two dozen times. Uh, the president did say today that he will allow journalists into some of these overcrowded facilities at some point. He did not give a time frame for when that will actually happen, though. He also said today that, the, the, that he is pushing his administration to work much more quickly to reunite families, especially those kids who have phone numbers of relatives here in the United States on them when they cross into this country, like the child that we met on the border earlier this week. The president suggested that if people don't work quickly to make this change happen and see these reunifications happen faster, people will be losing their jobs. Lindsay, I got a little bit of an update for you. We spoke to that grandfather again today of that little boy we spoke to. Spoke to. He has heard from authorities. They're now trying to figure out how to reunite this family. Potentially good news. Thank you, Cecilia. And let's also bring in our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, who was watching this press conference closely. Martha, the president was asked about that new threat from North Korea, firing two ballistic missiles in the past 24 hours, as seen in these images from North Korean state media. It's the first serious provocation by North Korea in Biden's first months in office. How did he respond today? Well, he would not say there was any red line with North Korea, and that was probably a wise thing for him not to do. But he did say North Korea violated a U.N. resolution by launching those two short-range missiles. But he said he wants some form of diplomacy, open to some form of diplomacy, although he did have a warning for the North, saying if they choose to escalate, we will respond accordingly. Lindsay. And the president was also asked about the timeline for withdrawing U.S. troops from Afghanistan and whether it will happen by May 1st, as the Trump administration had negotiated. He, he said it would be very hard to get those some 2,500 troops out of Afghanistan by May. But he said emphatically, we will leave. He said it was hard to imagine that the U.S. would have troops there next year. You know, in the fall, Lindsay, it will be 20 years of having U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Some of the soldiers and other troops over there in Afghanistan right now weren't even born when this started. Oh, wow. And lastly, just to go back to immigration for a moment, we heard the president seem to really reject the idea that his policies or message are inviting this surge of unaccompanied minors. But you reported, of course, from the U.S.-Mexico border last week, and that's exactly what you heard. It's exactly what I heard, Lindsay. You know, it's one thing for political opponents to say they're doing it because of Joe Biden. But when you're actually talking to people who cross the border and you say, why did you come? And they say, we thought Joe Biden would welcome us. That, that's a different story altogether. So we went right to the source there. We actually went into Mexico as well. And there was young, uh, a young woman and her young son who told us that they had been returned to Mexico. They had crossed over the river. Uh, were brought back into Mexico, sent back into Mexico, and she said she thought she would be welcomed there, but she was wrong. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. You too.
Now to the severe weather that millions are facing tonight. Tornado watches are up in seven states across the south and up into Indiana. Earlier today, there were tornado outbreaks across Alabama, including this massive twister that caused major damage and turned trees into mere splinters. At least three people are reported to be dead in one Alabama county tonight. Our Ginger Z has been on the ground and has the forecast in just a moment. But first, this report. Tonight, deadly tornadoes slamming the southeast. Multiple people injured in Alabama and at least three dead in Calhoun County. One of the main monster tornadoes ripping across the densely populated south side of Birmingham. And understand this is a very dangerous uh, situation and the weather service in Birmingham is now calling this a tornado emergency. In Pelham, the twister flinging debris into the air. This is a large, violent tornado that is down. First responders racing to help those trapped. These are those raw moments where we show up and this tornado just went through. Uh, the fire and police just got the folks that were in this home out. They are alive. They went to the hospital. But there are homes with their roofs off, there are homes collapsed, and this is just one of the neighborhoods that was impacted. It just didn't sound like it was that bad. Mm -hmm. When I came out, I was really shocked to see how bad it was. Mm. Across the street, we met Tanya Sims, who survived in her basement with her pets. If you look in here, this her, her bedroom is open to the world. She took us into her home where all the back windows were shattered. The walls in her bedroom blown away. Wow, that is just, that amount of that devastation is just jaw-dropping there. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z joins us now. And Ginger, quite a day you and your team have had. Tell us more about what you're seeing and what people can expect in the coming hours. And that's the thing, this is just one neighborhood. Come up these stairs with me because there used to be a front door here, but now it has collapsed the huge home that was here and those ladders in the corner, that's where Larry and Mary Rose climbed out of. The couple that was in that basement and survived, they were very, very lightly injured, thankfully. They went to the hospital. And actually, just moments ago, we met with them. We found Mary Rose's purse. It is one of those shocking moments. I've had this unique part of history of being able to be the first person that comes into their faces after something like this happens. And I have to tell you, Mary Rose was one of those women that was just blessed to be alive. She Said. And so, unfortunately, we still have a threat tonight. The heavy raindrops here. We have a tornado emergency just to our southeast. And there are still tornado watches all over the map that go from southern Indiana down into Alabama. North Georgia, you are not out of the woods. As we go through tonight, eastern Tennessee, I'm telling you, this raindrop in Alabama, when I interned here 21 years ago, I can tell you they are different. The thunderstorms here are different, and tonight they will be too. That very large hail is possible on top of the damaging winds. It goes through the overnight, early morning hours of tomorrow, but it really starts to lose steam, thankfully, Lindsay, as it makes its way into South Carolina, Virginia, and North Carolina. Uh, boy, we do not need another day like this because we have a long night ahead. Right, and it just started raining while we've been talking, correct? We have, this is the thing, is we have rounds of severe storms. Thankfully, uh, the worst of it is about 12 miles so south of us right now, so we're not seeing that part. But there are plenty of showers, damaging winds that could still come through. And when you have debris like this, those things can easily become projectiles. And that's right. something we get concerned with when we have a storm and then multiple rounds going into the night as well. So people just need to be indoors and in their shelters as soon as the warning hits. Right, and stay safe out there, Forest Ginger. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Now to the mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado. The suspect appeared in court for the first time today, brought into court in a wheelchair to face 10 counts of murder. And today, the Boulder police tweeting that when they took the suspect into custody, they used the handcuffs of the officer who he had killed. Our Matt Gutman reports. Tonight, those first images of the man accused of that supermarket rampage wheeled into court, handcuffed, and in a blue jail suit. The judge informing 21-year-old Ahmed Alisa he faces 10 counts of murder, plus a single count of attempted murder for allegedly shooting at an officer during Monday's massacre at King Supers. Sir, do you understand those rights as I've explained them to you this morning? We need you to answer out loud, yes. okay. In court, Alisa's public defenders requesting three months to assess his mental health. We cannot begin to assess the nature and depth of Mr. Alisa's mental illness until we have the discovery from the government 
Friends and family have reportedly said Elisa struggled both with controlling his anger and with mental health. But today, the DA is saying it's too early to worry about strategy. Are you concerned that the defense will say that he's unfit to stand for trial? We'll have to see how it unfolds in court. In court, those deputies flanking Elisa wearing those black stripes over their badges to honor slain officer Eric Talley. And today, the Boulder Police Department tweeting that when officers took Elisa into official custody, they used Tally's handcuffs, calling it a small gesture and hopefully the start of the healing process that so many of us need at this time. And tonight, we're hearing for the first time from the family of 23-year-old Nevin Stanisic, the son of Serbian refugees. The Denver Post reporting he was a repairman who had already left the supermarket. After fixing a coffee machine, he was shot in the parking lot in his car. His family thanking the Serbian community across the U.S. for their support. So many communities really stepping up to support the Boulder community. Matt Gutman joins us now from Boulder. Matt, certainly a somber mood at that memorial. And you're also learning tonight that the suspect has been moved to a new facility. An undisclosed facility, Lindsay. Uh, apparently, the sheriff's office is saying that they had him on suicide watch initially at the Boulder County Jail, but deputies there say that they heard rumblings of death threats against him. And as a precaution, they decided it would be better to get him out of there. We understand he is under protective custody, basically isolation in a cell at this point, um, and will likely remain in that cell in isolation for two to three more months because he's not been granted bail. The next step in the procedure proceedings uh, is another hearing, basically an assessment of his ability to withstand, to stand for trial because um, his defense today suggested that perhaps his, his mental health might play a significant role in the proceedings to come, Lindsay. Matt Gutman, our thanks to you. And now to the two steps forward, one step back path that we've been on against the coronavirus with now a third of all American adults having received at least one vaccine dose. New cases are rising again in 20 states by more than 10 percent. President Biden today doubling his goal from 100 million to 200 million shots in his first 100 days of office. And a new trial on young children is being called a next step toward herd immunity. Our Victor Akendo has more. Tonight, as the country tops 30 million cases of the coronavirus, infections are on the rise. In 20 states, case averages are climbing more than 10% in the last week. She's going to count for me, One, okay? Two, three. It comes as four, Pfizer is starting to test its vaccine on younger children ages seven, 5 to 11. Five. Six, that good. seven. Okay. The first participants, nine-year-old twins, Marisol and Alejandra Gerardo. Their mother is an infectious disease doctor. As a parent, where your number one job is keeping your kids safe and healthy. It honestly was just really reassuring to know that they may be getting some level of immunity there. Researchers say it's a critical step in getting this country to herd immunity reached after roughly 80% of Americans are vaccinated. Children make up a significant proportion of our population. So in trying to achieve herd immunity, it really is important that we are able to include children in vaccination programs. Today, AstraZeneca, the fourth vaccine maker, expected to seek emergency authorization from the FDA, updating its trial results after being accused of using outdated data. The company now says its vaccine is 76% effective against symptomatic disease, 3% less than earlier reported, and the vaccine remains 100% effective against severe disease and hospitalization. This is a fabulous vaccine, uh, safe and effective. But I wish the company had just done a better job of communicating those results. At least 32 states are expanding vaccine access for everyone 16 and older by the president's May 1st deadline. In California, 32 million people will have the green light by April 15th. There's not just light at the end of the tunnel, there's bright light at the end of the tunnel. Those concerns from the spring breakers continue. Victor Akendo joins us now from Miami Beach. And Victor, that curfew is set to go into effect, but are officials expecting it to, to really have an impact on the many young people who continue to flock to the area? Well, that is the hope, Lindsay. Police made it clear last weekend they were no longer going to tolerate the kind of behavior happening here on South Beach's Entertainment District. So the question is, as we head into weekend number two with these emergency measures in place, do these new people who have come into town, the new tourists, this new wave that has come in, do they know about the rules? Police tell us that they are ready for anything, but they also acknowledge they're tired, they're fatigued. They have been dealing with these crowds for almost six weeks now. Bottom line, I think we're all pulling for a peaceful night here on South 
South Beach. Lindsay? Indeed. Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. And when we come back, the plane forced to land because of an unruly passenger, what the passengers and crew were forced to do to him. As more and more people get vaccinated, the yearn to travel only grows. In tonight's Vaccine Watch, we'll tackle vaccine passports. What are the plans and what's being discussed? But up next, the $100 million pledge by the Jesuits to atone for the fact that they, as a religious organization, owned slaves. How do they plan to do it? Stay with us. What if someone said to you, Shut up. Shut up and dribble. And dribble. Shut up and what? Tuesday night on Soul of a Nation. For me, I was just like, oh, play ball and be quiet. When you hear that, that's disrespectful. It's, it's crazy. Black athletes speak out. Here we are right in the thick of things. And change the game. It was about them raising their voices as athletes. This was national news. So powerful. Tuesday night. Soul of a Nation. Soul of a Nation. At 10, 9 central on ABC. Friday night, a true crime investigation. We did not have a body. There was no murder weapon. The time was ticking away. He was the last known person to see her alive. I'm with ABC News 2020. Anything to say? I just thought, what if she's been out there? It was just, what if, what if? Get ready, we're about 10 seconds away. It's Ryan Smith, ABC News. Now, new details. The new 2020 True Crime Event Special, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe we want to The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Authorities tonight say a Cleveland to L.A. flight had to be diverted after a passenger tried to open an exit door mid-flight. Crew members and other passengers had to restrain him by holding him down in a seat. When they landed, the unruly passenger was taken away by paramedics for an evaluation. We turn now to an original sin by a popular order of the Catholic Church, and that's the ownership and sale of enslaved people. Selling hundreds of these human beings once saved the prestigious Georgetown University, and now these storied institutions are facing a reckoning. ABC's Alex Perche reports. Ain't no power like the power of the people, because the power of the people don't stop. At a time when the issue of race is front and center, the country is finding ways to confront its ugly past. Now, the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, have vowed to raise $100 million in an attempt to atone for its role in slavery here in the U.S. Yes, even the Roman Catholic Church owns slaves. Joseph Stewart is one of the descendants of these enslaved people, and in 2017, he petitioned Jesuit leaders to take action. Because we wanted to get Rome involved in trying to reconcile uh, with the descendants and the Jesuits here in the United States a pathway forward, a pathway to jump from the 200-year history of the sale of our ancestors to a new beginning. The result was a dialogue between his group, the Descendants Truth and Reconciliation Foundation, and Father Tim Kosecki, the president of the Jesuit Conference of Canada and the U.S. The Jesuits agreeing to start with that $100 million pledge. About half of that money, which the Jesuits will raise, would go towards a foundation that engages in racial reconciliation. 
There's also money to pay for education opportunities for descendants of these enslaved people and a smaller portion for an emergency fund for them. Is this atonement? You know, my apology, I was very clear that we resisted moving on but embraced moving forward. And th there's no saying we're sorry and walking away. The, the, this is this is a lifelong partnership. Father Kasecki says $15 million of that pledge is already in a trust. The, the process that we're beginning is, is reconciling with, with people like Mr. Stewart and others. It's forming a partnership that we hope models the kind of truth and reconciliation we need as a country. And we know that, as I said, it's a step. The, the real work is still ahead of us. Stewart is a descendant of Maryland Jesuit-owned slaves, 272 sold in 1838, many ending up in Louisiana, helping save the nation's preeminent Jesuit institution from financial ruin, Georgetown University. Richard Cellini is a Georgetown alum. He's also the founder of the Georgetown Memory Project. My question was, what happened to the people? What happened to the 272 men, women, and children that Georgetown and the Maryland Jesuits sold to Southern Louisiana? He started digging. So far, he's identified 10,642 direct descendants of the Georgetown 272 and has found others whose ancestors were enslaved by the Society of Jesus. Like the Norton sisters, Rhonda and Shanda learned of their family's ties to the Jesuits in 2016. They met us at St. Ignatius Church Chapel Point, also known as St. Thomas Manor, a Jesuit residence and former plantation. It's bigger than just the so-called Georgetown Jesuits, but the actual Maryland mission, yeah. they really owned close to a thousand uh, slaves. They were able to trace back six generations to Regis Goff in White Marsh, Maryland. Regis Goff, he was one of 20 Goffs that were owned by the Maryland mission. Yeah. So, you know, there's so much more to still discover for us learning and being able to discover the connections is exciting, but it's also, it also kind of makes you angry because the idea that there are entities that knew all of this, but just didn't share it. You know, like we have a right to know. News about this pledge is spreading, but just as not all black people are monolithic in their thinking, neither are these descendants. But I feel like that that settlement does not represent me. It's a complex issue. You need to have, uh, you know, various people, descendants from different backgrounds sitting down and really giving their input. The Descendant Association has had many open invitations for people to participate, and that door is still open. But some have questioned whether the $100 million pledge properly addresses the country's original sin. The Jesuits have not been forthcoming about the total amount of wealth um, generated to the Society of Jesus by 150 years of Jesuit slaveholding. Let me be simple. They've not yet produced a balance sheet. That's opened the discussion for a different type of atonement. I think the only way for the, them to atone for the history of enslavement is by providing reparations to the descendants of those people that they enslaved. Sandra Green Thomas is a descendant of Sam and Betsy Harris, two of the 272 enslaved people sold to Louisiana plantation owners to help Georgetown University. She's also the mother of ABC producer Elizabeth Thomas. Think about what they're doing in Evanston. She's talking about Evanston, Illinois which recently became the first U.S. city to make reparations available to black residents for past discrimination and unfair housing practices. Congratulations. Qualifying households would receive $25,000 for home repairs or down payments on property. We could be doing all these sorts of things as a model for the rest of this country about how to repair the damage that was done to black people. And we won't get involved in the individual calculations. We respect those who want to. We encourage them to do as they will, and we pray that they will have some success. The Jesuits insist this is a start. In a statement to ABC News, a Georgetown University spokesperson wrote, Georgetown has been honored to work with descendant leaders in the Jesuit community on the establishment of the new foundation and looks forward to continued collaboration. Georgetown will also move forward on university initiatives, including our new annual fund to support community projects to benefit descendant communities. Our aim, working with members of our community and the descendant community, is to provide our first grants this year. 
For the descendants, this is an exercise in faith. You know, to find out that, you know, my ancestors were owned by faithful people, um, it, it hasn't really deterred me or my faith in any way. I think it's just strengthened it to know that, you know, there is hope, there's possibilities there. And, um, you know, if we stay faithful, uh, you know, we will come to a resolution that, um, you know, everyone will feel comfortable with. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Our thanks to Alex. And still ahead here on Prime, the $9 billion a day mistake and how with each day it threatens to throw more of the globe's commerce into chaos. The new allegation rocking New York's embattled governor, how he's accused of helping his CNN anchor brother. And how will the Biden administration deal with North Korea's latest missile launch? We take a look by the numbers at the so-called hermit kingdom. And our tweet of the day, happy birthday, Elton John. He celebrated this one by sharing this cute picture with his boys. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. What if someone said to you, Shut up. Shut up and dribble. And dribble. Shut up and what? Tuesday night on Soul of a Nation. For me, I was just like, oh, play ball and be quiet. When you hear that, that's disrespectful. It's, it's crazy. Black athletes speak out. Here we are right in the thick of things. And change the game. It was about them raising their voices as athletes. This was national news. So powerful. Tuesday night. Soul of a Nation. Soul of a Nation. At 10, 9 central on ABC. Friday night, a true crime investigation. We did not have a body. There was no murder weapon. The time was ticking away. He was the last known person to see her alive. I'm with ABC News 2020. Anything to say? I just thought, what if she's been out there? It was just, what if, what if? Get ready, we're about 10 seconds away. It's Ryan Smith, ABC News. Now, new details. The new 2020 True Crime Event Special, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News honored winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back, everybody. Today, President Biden called North Korea our biggest foreign policy threat and said that while he's open to diplomacy, the U.S. will respond accordingly if Kim Jong-un decides to escalate. We take a look at North Korea's recent provocations by the numbers. This week, North Korea launched two ballistic missiles in its first test of the Biden administration. They were short-range missiles that traveled an estimated 260 miles before landing in the Sea of Japan, according to U.S. and South Korean officials. It's the first first time that North Korea has launched ballistic missiles in more than a year, and it violated UN Security Council resolutions. Over the weekend, North Korea launched two short-range cruise missiles, but Biden administration officials said that these actions were, quote, in the category of normal activity. 2017, that's the last time that North Korea conducted long-range missile tests, but they continue to develop their nuclear and missile capabilities. Meanwhile, UN Security Council sanctions have prohibited North Korea from exporting more than 
80% of the items it sold abroad in 2016, and they block most financial interactions with that country. Still lots ahead here tonight on Prime. Could vaccine passports be the modern day version of a golden ticket? We'll hear from the companies and visit at least one country trying to test out versions of it. Cicadas, yes, they can be annoying. We know that, but in tonight's It's Not Too Late, Ginger Z explains why they are critical to our biodiversity. And paying tribute to Jessica Walter, best known as the hilariously funny Lucille Bluth. But first, to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What if someone said to you, Shut up. Shut up and dribble. And dribble. Shut up and what? Tuesday night on Soul of a Nation. For me, I was just like, oh, play ball and be quiet. When you hear that, that's disrespectful. It's, it's crazy. Black athletes speak out. Here we are right in the thick of things. And change the game. It was about them raising their voices as athletes. This was national news. So powerful. Tuesday night. Soul of a Nation. Soul of a Nation. At 10, 9 central on ABC. Friday night, a true crime investigation. We did not have a body. There was no murder weapon. The time was ticking away. He was the last known person to see her alive. I'm with ABC News 2020. Anything to say? I just thought, what if she's been out there? It was just, what if, what if? Get ready, we're about 10 seconds away. It's Ryan Smith, ABC News. Now, new details. The new 2020 True Crime Event Special, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is Ginger Z, and if you love the Oscars, or if you're just curious about all that hype, well, then you're going to love this. Inside the Oscars, the podcast, counting down to Hollywood's biggest night. Listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Friday night, a true crime investigation. We did not have a body. There was no murder weapon. The time was ticking away. What if she's been out there? What if, what if? Get ready, we're about 10 seconds away. 2020, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. 65 days into his administration, President Biden walking out to face reporters for his first press conference. What is your reaction to these images that have come out from that particular facility? Is what's happening inside acceptable to you? That's a serious question, right? That's an acceptable to me. Come on. That's why we're going to be moving a thousand of those kids out quickly. That is totally unacceptable. Tonight, there are some 16,000 unaccompanied migrant children now in U.S. custody, a near record. Many of those migrants said they made that dangerous journey north because they believed it would be easier now. The other urgent crisis, those two mass shootings in the span of a week, 18 lives lost. But facing the political reality that with the 50-50 split in the Senate, his party does not have the votes to pass sweeping gun control legislation, the president issuing this warning to Republicans, signaling he could back changing rules in the Senate to push his agenda through. We're going to get a lot done. And if we have to, if there's complete 
lockdown and chaos is a consequence of the filibuster, then we'll have to go beyond what I'm talking about. Those first images of the man accused of that supermarket rampage wheeled into court, handcuffed, and in a blue jail suit. The judge informing 21-year-old Ahmed Alisa he faces 10 counts of murder, plus a single count of attempted murder. Sir, do you understand those rights as I've explained them to you this morning? In court, Elisa's public defenders requesting three months to assess his mental health. We cannot begin to assess the nature and depth of Mr. Elisa's mental illness until we have the discovery from the government. Friends and family have reportedly said Elisa struggled both with controlling his anger and with mental health. And tonight we're hearing for the first time from the family of 23-year-old Nevin Stanisic, the son of Serbian refugees. His family thanks thanking the Serbian community across the U.S. for their support. Multiple newspapers are reporting that back in March, at the beginning of the pandemic, the governor instructed top health officials to prioritize COVID testing for his family members and top associates. According to the Albany Times Union, those family members included his mother and brother, CNN anchor Chris Cuomo. Those priority tests came at a time when millions of New Yorkers were struggling to find available testing. The Times Union says an official within the governor's office claims the testing was done in good faith in an effort to trace the virus. This new accusation comes as the governor faces multiple allegations of inappropriate behavior. Cuomo still denies ever touching anyone inappropriately. Last week, jobless claims dipped below 700,000 for the first time since the outbreak began. So there are still too many Americans out of work, too many families hurting, and they still have a lot of work to do. There are about 19 million Americans claiming some form of government jobless aid. So we still have substantially more healing to go to get the economy uh, back to a more normal level and condition. Emmy award-winning actress Jessica Walter passed away in New York at the age of 80. Best known for her role as Lucille Bluth in Arrested Development, she had a long career as a working actor for six decades. Get me a vodka rocks. Mom, it's breakfast. And a piece of toast. Her daughter saying in a statement, her greatest pleasure was bringing joy to others through her storytelling both on screen and off. Bald eagles once on the verge of extinction are soaring again. New figures show the bald eagle population in the U.S. has quadrupled since 2009 thanks to new protections and conservation efforts. Their populations declined between 1870 and 1970 because of hunting and the use of a powerful insecticide. Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland calling the turnaround a historic conservation success story. As more people around the world are getting vaccinated against COVID-19 and looking to return to some semblance of normalcy, including for many renewed hopes of travel. One new issue that's emerging is just who will be able to go where until COVID is under control. So could a vaccine passport become the new normal? ABC's Bob Woodruff takes a look in this week's Vaccine Watch. This is not 2019, it's right now. The most ordinary scenes, now extraordinary, as nightclubs in Israel are opening up. It's a thing that we didn't have for like a year. So it's cool, it's amazing. You can look how much I'm shining and happy just to sit up in the bar. And not just nightclubs and bars, restaurants, cafes, and even concerts are requiring these QR codes to get in proof that you have been vaccinated for COVID-19. It's called a green pass. The idea being that having this green pass essentially allows you to then go back into society and participate in society. Passes like these are being developed and tested around the world, many calling them vaccine passports. Something that uh, will allow people to show that they're vaccinated uh, when they travel from country to country. Here we go, your QR code, please. Proof yep. of vaccination will also open doors here in the U.S. The Miami Heat says it'll reserve an entire section of its arena for fans who can present their paper vaccine cards. Your vaccine card is a little white card you get that has evidence that you've been vaccinated. But there are now concerns that your CDC vaccination cards could be lost, stolen, or copied. We're faced with the biggest data challenge, if you want to call that a puzzle of our lifetimes.
and it's based on trust. Trust, powered by technology. Companies like IBM are working to streamline vaccine passports here in the U.S. What exactly is your digital health pass doing? And we're providing a trusted platform in order to say, yes, I've been tested negative or I've received the vaccine and I'm ready to go forward. These passports will not only show your vaccine status, but if required, your COVID test results. And IBM is already starting pilot programs in major U.S. cities. Tell me about in, uh, uh, you know, your program right here in New York. A group of people who were going to a couple of events. The first one was uh, a basketball game and said, look, we're going to take you through the process of being tested. When you're tested negative, that test would go ahead and then go to the state of New York into their database of those that have been tested. And then that database would push a, a capability to your phone. So you'd get that record. So you'd have that on your phone. And then when you go to the event with an ID in your phone, you could validate, yes, I've tested negative. One of the tenants was to make sure that if you didn't have a smartphone, that you can, in fact, print out that same QR code and use a two-factor capability to get into a given event. Clear, the company with those familiar kiosks at airports around the country, is also working on a vaccine passport. It's partnered with a new app called Common Pass. If people give proof that they have gotten a vaccine or they've been, they've been tested to see if they've got the virus, is this a violation of, of privacy? No, it's not, because the way Common Pass works, the destination basically just says what the rules are. So Aruba has said, OK, if you want to come to Aruba, the rule is you need to get a negative PCR test within 72 hours of your flight. So what passengers do is they go to one of our trusted testing partners, they get tested, they share that test result with Common Pass. Common Pass automatically looks at that test result, compares it to Aruba's rules, and says, green light, you're good to go. The only thing that Aruba gets or the airline gets is Paul is good to go to travel to Aruba. That's the only thing that's actually conveyed. In an attempt to streamline digitizing your vaccination information, Clear and Common Pass have partnered with one of the largest retailers in the country, Walmart. If you're vaccinated at a Walmart, the company will make that information digitally available on Common Pass. But the idea of vaccine passports raises other issues. So much about this pandemic has not been equitable and has not been fair. And so this is another way that you could potentially cause disparities. Disparities for those who don't want a vaccine. Green passports is all about hurting our basic rights. And for those without access to one. Because it's not yet approved for them or because it's not yet available to them. We're telling people that the vaccine isn't mandatory, but then if you're using these types of things, you're essentially making it mandatory. Another hurdle, which vaccines will be accepted for international travel? We have so many different vaccine candidates around the world. They have different levels of efficacy. In Turkey, we found that the only vaccine available there is from the Chinese company Sinovac, which appears to be far less effective than those available in the U.S. Do you think these companies, the airlines, countries, do you think they will require particular vaccines in order to allow you in? I think they will. I think that's already happening. So when will the rest of the world look like this? The Biden administration has not yet announced um, a particular plan for a vaccination passport within the United States. Despite rising vaccination rates and so many itching for travel and tourism, until nations can reach a universal standard for what a vaccine passport may look like, saving the summer could still take time. This is Bob Woodruff, tracking the vaccine. A few more staycations in our future are thanks to Bob. To the battle for voting rights playing out across the country and in Congress tonight. A short time ago in Georgia, Governor Kemp signed a sweeping overhaul of state election laws restricting voting by mail and giving more oversight of the election to the state legislature. Democrats in Congress say laws like that are exactly why their voting rights legislation is urgently needed, while Republicans are crying foul. Mary Alice Parks is in Washington with more. 
Shame, shame, shame. Senate Democrats sounding the alarm, arguing their sweeping voting rights legislation is needed to protect against state bills led by Republican legislatures, which they say are designed to limit ballot access after record turnout in 2020. There is a concerted nationwide effort to limit the right of American citizens to vote. I would like to ask my Republican colleagues, why are you so afraid of democracy? In the wake of last year's elections, when Republicans lost control of the White House and the Senate, state GOP parties pushed more than 250 pieces of new local elections-related legislation in more than 40 states. Voting rights experts say those bills could make voting harder for millions by cutting options for early voting and mail-in ballots. The Democrats' national voting rights bill would lower barriers for voting, including putting in place automatic voter registration and requiring same-day voter registration, too. It would end partisan gerrymandering and strengthen campaign finance laws. Republicans have stood firmly against the bill, which passed the House earlier this month, calling it an extreme Washington overreach. This legislation would forcibly rewrite the election laws of all 50 states from here in Washington. Republicans say the new state laws are needed to restore confidence in U.S. elections, though experts say elections are safe and secure. Just this last week, former President Trump's one-time lawyer, Sidney Powell, who for months last winter filed lawsuits and pushed conspiracy theories about election fraud, argued in her defense in court that no reasonable person should have believed her election theories were truly statements of fact. Now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has promised to bring Democrats' voting rights bill to the Senate floor for a vote, but, Lindsay, he has not yet set a date. Thanks to Mary Alice for that. The major bottleneck at one of the world's most critical waterways continues after a massive cargo ship was blown sideways, blocking the Suez Canal. Let's bring in Maggie Ruley from London. Maggie, walk our viewers through why this is just such a big deal. Hey, Lindsay. Yeah, you probably learned about the Suez Canal well, many years ago in school, and today we're really seeing just the vital importance of its effect on global trade. You look at the Suez Canal, it is one of the most important waterways in the world. It links Europe to Asia. You know, without it, Lindsay, ships have to go all the way around Africa. It's a dangerous journey, can take a week or more. This is something that global shipping magnets do not want to have to deal with. And right now, though, we know that hundreds of ships are blocked because of Ever Given. That's the name of the ship that's currently blocking the canal. And when, you know, you look at just how vital this is to global trade. Lindsay, the numbers are staggering. Last year, we're told that about uh, 50 ships a day passed through that canal, and in total, a tenth of all of the weight of all good ships around the world go through this canal. So it is just crucial to global trade, and we're already seeing some of the effects of it being blocked off like this. You know, all eyes right now are on oil. The Suez Canal is just vital to the global oil trade. You know, there's tankers uh, with U.S. oil, Russian oil, Saudi oil, all blocked right now from going through this canal. So that could be one of the first impacts we really see, a rise in oil prices. But it's more than that, Lindsay. The knockoff effects could be incredible. I mean, we are talking about global shipping trade, which is timed sometimes to the minute. So you have so many ships that are blocked right now for days, potentially for weeks. They have to make some big decisions. Ports are going to be blocked off because of this. So when we look towards the future of how this might impact you, things like shipping costs could be affected. So this is only just starting, but the implications are going to be felt around the world. And it's a reminder of just how connected the global trade really is. Yeah, you're exactly right. And what's the expectation as far as how long it will take to fix this? And what are they thinking about doing to open the Suez back up? Yeah, this is the big question. How long is this going to take? We're told right now it could be days, but we've even heard some people say weeks. It's really not known. Uh, it is a huge procedure. Ever given the, uh, the ship that is blocking right now is one of the largest container ships. It's four football fields long. If you want another description, it's about as tall as the Empire State Building. So uh, that is an incredible ship that they have to move. And, you know, they're starting right now by using tugboats. It might sound like a little thing, but their tugboats are often used to push and pull these big container ships. So they do have some tugboats deployed right now. They're trying to move it. They've also tried to lighten up the container ship. That so far has not worked. Believe it or not, lightening up a container ship can be a dangerous process. There are fears about causing the a ship to become imbalanced, potentially tipping over. Uh, so, you know, lots of things to consider. Uh, a third option they have, too, is, is dredging. So actually removing some of the soil and sand from underneath the ship. But that is a huge process as well. So, uh, Lindsay, they are working on this. The government has put out videos showing that they're 
working on this, but it is a huge problem and it might take a long time to find a good solution. Yeah, the size of the Empire State yeah. Building, that really puts things in perspective for us. Maggie Ruley, thank you so much. Trillions of cicadas are getting ready to take flight on the East Coast. And yes, you heard that correctly, trillions. At first you might think, oh, that's awful or disgusting. But as Ginger Z explains in this week's It's Not Too Late, we should celebrate one of nature's greatest marvels. Hi, I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. And I have a warning for you. The cicadas are coming. The loud, the plentiful, the awesome aphid is just weeks from emerging. And can we just get one simple fact out of the way? It is not a locust. And here's something so fascinating. This particular breed uses the base of trees, the root system, and they are underground for 17 years. It's quite a spectacle. It's, it's one of the natural wonders of the world. And, uh, you know, a lot of people always call in or write into us about how do I get rid of them and, and all that. And the best thing I can say is just sit back and, and appreciate it, if not enjoy it for what it is. You can't really get rid of them and you probably don't want to. They're a natural part of our forests. And while some of you might be dreading that invasion or maybe you've seen one of these before, well, this is good news because it actually means that our ecosystem's doing well. I spoke with a guy named John Cooley. He's a cicada expert and he runs the Cicada Project at the University of Connecticut. He was telling me that the cicada's been around for millions of years and they've adapted to all different types of changes in the climate. This female took about 30 minutes to emerge from her nymphal skeleton. However, they have never seen the rapidity of change that we have happening right now because of us. So they really don't know how the cicada is going to react. We're talking about something that happens on the scale of 150 years. That's unprecedented. And how they will respond to it, it's really not enough time for them to adapt in an evolutionary sense. You're talking, you know, for cicada, 150 years, you're talking less than 10 generations. So that isn't much. Um, what'll happen to them? It's a good question. And that's really important. Entomologists tell us that when the bugs go down, we're in huge trouble. We know that it's already happening to the big pollinators, like the bees. I've done so many stories on the bees. And when I went down to Mexico in 2012 to see where all the monarchs migrate to, their story has not been a great one since then. But they aren't the only insects. Insects are so important. Insects and, and their allies, invertebrates, the spiders, uh, the crustaceans, the snails. These are animals that are really driving our uh, ecosystems and helping humans in really a meaningful way. So I like to say, if you like birds in your backyard, you should like insects because 96% of songbirds feed insects to their young. If we didn't have insects, we wouldn't have songbirds. If you like to eat salmon, you should thank an insect because the salmon um, grow up in streams where they're eating insects uh, as young before they get out to the ocean where they could be caught and eaten. Even animals like grizzly bears, they eat salmon, which rely on insects, and they eat berries, which rely on insect pollination. And that gets us right back to humans. One third of all of our food relies on insect pollinators. If you like our most nutritious foods, if you like a good salad, uh, if you like our fruits and berries, you can thank an insect. So really insects are driving these systems and without them we'd be in real trouble. And bugs, at least on land, are disappearing. And a lot of it is because of extreme swings in temperatures, but more so the invasion of us into their territory. One paper that looked at thousands of studies found that the numbers, as far as decline goes, 9% of land insects declining every decade. The major causes of biodiversity loss are, as people have said, the death by a thousand cuts, right? We just impede into every part of these animals' lives. And unfortunately, study after study on group after group shows that all of these animals or that the groups that are studied are declining at an alarming rate. Uh, and, and we really should all be 
concerned and, and it should be a wake up call for, for all of us. And without these animals, um, we're gonna be in a world of hurt. But it's not all bad news. Freshwater insect numbers are up, and a lot of that's because we've started protecting that water. So hopefully I've endeared you a bit to the cicada. And if so, and you suddenly care, it's really easy to help. All insects. Eat sustainable foods, plant some flowers, don't use pesticides, and don't kill them. And I promise, it's not too late. Our thanks to Ginger. And finally this hour, our image of the day. Take a look at this remarkable image of a bee flying toward a cherry blossom. This one in Germany to collect pollen. It is cherry blossom season all around the globe. If you are near one, try to take a moment to enjoy Mother Nature's beauty. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and have a great night. When we come back, we're continuing to. The reality is our country can collapse from within. Consequences. And we'll explain how the Supreme Court made it easier to sue police for excessive force. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. The new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate. The war among us. This is a real wake up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition, the number one daytime talk show, and number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. What if someone said to you, Shut up. Shut up and dribble. And dribble. Shut up and what? Tuesday night on Soul of a Nation. For me, I was just like, oh, play ball and be quiet. When you hear that, that's disrespectful. It's, it's crazy. Black athletes speak out. Here we are right in the thick of things. And change the game. It was about them raising their voices as athletes. This was national news. So powerful. Tuesday night. Soul of a Nation. Soul of a Nation. At 10, 9 central on ABC. Friday night, a true crime investigation. We did not have a body. There was no murder weapon. The time was ticking away. He was the last known person to see her alive. I'm with ABC News 2020. Anything to say? I just thought, what if she's been out there? It was just, what if, what if? Get ready, we're about 10 seconds away. It's Ryan Smith, ABC News. Now, new details. The new 2020 true crime event special. Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. I'm Lindsay Davis. Welcome back. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. President Biden is expanding his vaccination goal as Pfizer is expanding its trial to include younger children ages 5 to 11. This is 32 states are expanding access for everyone 16 and older, but it is a race against time. 20 states have seen their cases climb by more than 10 percent just this week alone. The suspect charged with killing 10 people inside a Colorado supermarket made his first court appearance today. The alleged gunman was in a wheelchair. His attorneys asked the judge for three months to assess his mental health. And our weather team is in the south right now tracking tornadoes like this one in Alabama that plowed through communities earlier today. Take a look at these terrifying images captured inside a car. Several deaths have been recorded so far. The threat is not over but is expected to subside as we go later into the night. President Biden held his first formal news conference since coming into the White House. He covered a wide range of topics and was pressed repeatedly about that surge of the southern border and whether his policies have contributed to the increase of unaccompanied minors. And our chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega pressed the president on the difficult conditions at those border facilities, asking if it was acceptable. 65 days into his administration, President Biden walking out to face reporters for his first press conference, and it was the emergency at the southern border now threatening to overshadow his agenda that dominated. 
the questions striking a nerve. The Customs and Border Protection Facility in Donna, Texas, I was there, is at 1,556% capacity yep. right now with mostly unaccompanied minors. There are kids that are sleeping on floors. They are packed into these pods. What is your reaction to these images that have come out from that particular facility? Is what's happening inside acceptable to you? Uh, that's a serious question, right? <laughs> it's acceptable to me. Come on. That's why we're going to be moving a thousand of those kids out quickly. That is totally unacceptable. Tonight, there are some 16,000 unaccompanied migrant children now in U.S. custody, a near record. We spoke to migrants at the border, like nine year old Josel, who made the long journey from Honduras without his parents. The phone number for his grandfather in North Carolina, written on that pink hat. This is the number of his This is his grandfather's phone number. Many of those migrants said they made that dangerous journey north because they believed it would be easier now. Sir, you blame the last administration, but is your messaging in saying that these children are and will be allowed to stay in this country and work their way through this process, encouraging families like Joselle's to come? The idea that I'm going to say, which I would never do, that if an unaccompanied child ends up at the border, we're just going to let him starve to death and stay on the other side. No previous administration did that either, except Trump. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. The other urgent crisis, those two mass shootings in the span of a week, 18 lives lost. But facing the political reality that with the 50-50 split in the Senate, his party does not have the votes to pass sweeping gun control legislation, the president issuing this warning to Republicans, signaling he could back changing rules in the Senate to push his agenda through. We're going to get a lot done. And if we have to, if there's complete lockdown and chaos as a consequence of the filibuster, then we'll have to go beyond what I'm talking about. Our thanks to Cecilia. ABC News political director Rick Klein joins us now. Rick, the president started this press conference by touting progress against the pandemic, including the new goal of administering 200 million doses in his first 100 days. There are so many issues on his agenda, but is his performance on the pandemic the central factor on whether his first 100 days and beyond are considered a success? Yeah, Lindsay, President Biden today called it the fundamental problem, and he, he recognizes that uh, without solving the pandemic, without uh, providing that kind of leadership to the American people, he can do almost nothing else in his presidency. And, and I think we saw a confident President Biden today, confident in his agenda, confident in the basic assumptions he's made about the direction of the country, and a lot of that stems from the confidence that the American people have in him in the handling of COVID-19. And it was interesting, you know, that press conference went on for well more than an hour, Lindsay, all manner of, of topics came up, there wasn't a single question about the pandemic. Some people will criticize reporters for that, but I talked to one person close to the White House who said that's actually a good sign. If people aren't asking about it, then that generally means things are moving in the right direction. And that sense of optimism around it gives this White House hope that they can move on to other pressing issues because they know that without solving the pandemic, you really can't get much else done. And of course, reality does have a way of intruding with gun violence and the surge at the border already providing pressure for action. How did the president handle that in his press conference today as he grapples with these events? One at a time. That's what he says the prescription is for dealing with these uh, pressing issues, is that there's no sense in trying to grapple with all of them and, and to, to, to do the kind of chaotic, frenetic pace that maybe his predecessor uh, enjoyed and thrived in. The Biden pace is much different, and I think you saw that today. And I think in terms of a governing philosophy, dealing with an individual challenge, trying to marshal the political capital, the political will you need to, to try to deal with a concrete problem one at a time is the way that he hopes to do it. But a, as you say, all of the issues, these mass shootings, the provocation, for North Korea, the humanitarian crisis uh, on the border. All of these things are crashing in multiple directions. And I feel like the last couple of weeks are the first taste that Joe Biden has gotten of what that uh, the chaos that, that can descend on Washington looks like. He is trying to, to slow the pace, though, to just take one issue at a time. Uh, and as he says, just, just line these things up and deal with them and, and, and deal with that hand one at a time, try to deal with coalitions that you can build and, and to try to manage just individual crises, even if they're all competing for attention. And the president is also signaling that he thinks he can get a lot more done on his agenda, but it's all a matter of timing. So how does he see that ambitious agenda all playing out in a still very divided Washington? 
Yeah, this is so interesting, Lindsay, because he, he had some bold visions today that he shared, including one he said was to change the paradigm of governance, the relationship that people have with Congress, uh, with, the, with the, the federal government. He wants that to shift, but he really can't do that under the current governing structure. And the realities of the Senate filibuster are going to, are going to be making themselves evident more and more on issues like voting rights, on issues like gun rights, on issues like immigration. He made clear today, Lindsay, he's got no use for the Senate filibuster, even though he was a senator there for more than 30 years, a defender of the filibuster. He today described it as a relic of the Jim Crow era. That, to me, was a clear signal uh, to, to many of the progressives that are pushing for him to jettison the filibuster, to lend his moral authority, his voice to potentially getting rid of the Senate filibuster, even though he doesn't technically have a vote. Now, the votes aren't technically there either in the Senate as of now, but you can see where this conversation is moving, particularly on this issue of voting rights, which has really left the both parties warring in a major way. Rick Klein, thanks so much. And now to Washington, where today the U.S. Supreme Court handed down a decision that could dramatically change how alleged victims of police use of force can sue in federal court. ABC's Devin Dwyer, of course, covers the Supreme Court's for us, and he joins us now for more. Devin, this case involves our Fourth Amendment protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. Tell us what the justices said. Yeah, Lindsay, when we think about being seized by police, we normally think of hands-on pressure, the handcuffs, a chokehold, and the like. But the Supreme Court today dramatically expanded the scope of a seizure to include police bullets, even if the person gets away. Here's how Chief Justice John Roberts put it. He was writing for the 5-3 to three majority. He said, the application of physical force to the body of a person with the intent to restrain is a seizure, even if the person doesn't submit and is is not subdued. So the bottom line, if you're hit by a bullet by police, even if you get away, you can challenge that as a seizure under the Fourth Amendment in court, uh, perhaps as being an unreasonable or excessive use of force. So an expansion of that ability to sue police. Right. And you mentioned that expansion. It does sound like it could expand the ability of people to sue in alleged cases of excessive use of force. Yeah, this, this makes it a little bit easier for people to, to take those claims to federal court. This case actually comes out of New Mexico. A woman in 2014 was shot a couple of times by police there as she was driving away. Uh, she sued the officers in court for this uh, unreasonable seizure of her person. She said lower courts tossed it out, said because she wasn't apprehended or, or arrested, it didn't count. But the Supreme Court today, a majority of the justices clearly said that the officers seized toward Whereas for the instant the bullets struck her, uh, now whether or not that seizure, those bullets were reasonable, that's a different question. Whether or not these officers uh, are subject to immunity, also a separate question. But the case can go forward, uh, and it gives people now a new avenue in court. Lindsay? Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. Thank you. Next tonight to the largest settlement against any university in U.S. history. The University of Southern California agreeing to pay $852 million to hundreds of women accusing a former school doctor of sexual abuse. Here's ABC's Kaylee Hartung. Tonight, an historic settlement. The University of Southern California agreeing to pay $852 million to over 700 women who accused Dr. George Tendall, the school's longtime gynecologist, of sexual abuse. Powerful people at powerful institutions can and must be held to account. It's believed to be the largest settlement against a university in U.S. history. Today's settlement adds to an earlier $215 million settlement, bringing the total to over $1.1 billion. Dr. Tyndall was the only full-time gynecologist at USC for nearly three decades. Attorneys saying he treated tens of thousands of women. There are literally thousands of women that that man assaulted in that health center. And worse. Tendall faces 35 criminal counts of alleged sexual misconduct between 2009 and 2016 at the University Student Health Center. He has pleaded not guilty. Survivors like Lucy demand that justice be served. If not for justice for the victims, at least show future predators and those who would enable them. Lindsay, Dr. Tyndall left USC in 2017. He remains free on bond as he waits to go to trial. Lindsay.
Kaylee, thank you. Now to the deadly Atlanta shootings that targeted Asian businesses last week. They have sparked a renewed look inward for us as a country and our treatment of Asian people here. Now, former Tonight Show host and longtime comedian Jay Leno is coming forward apologizing for insensitive jokes that he's made about Asians in the past. ABC's Zoreen Shah has the latest. Longtime comedian and former Tonight Show host Jay Leno apologizing for decades of jokes targeting Asians, saying, In my heart, I knew it was wrong. This is just like a Hollywood award show, but with fewer Jews. <laughs> the Asian American activist group MANA says they've demanded Leno stop joking that Koreans or Chinese eat dogs or cats and apologize for nearly two decades. They say he finally apologized last month. Now saying, at the time I did those jokes, I genuinely thought them to be harmless. I think Jay realized that, you know, when you do jokes that are just kind of flippant and callous toward Asian Americans, it has an impact on how people think of them. We've documented cases where people have vandalized places, uh, attacked people on the streets saying, hey, do you guys eat dog? Leno's apology comes at a time when Asian Americans have increasingly been targeted with racist attacks that blame them for the virus. The group Stop AAPI Hate reports nearly 3,800 accounts of racism and discrimination in the last year. Just last week, an Atlanta mass shooter killed eight people. Six were Asian Americans. Leno told Mana he was shocked and saddened by what was happening to the Asian community and says, I would be deeply hurt and ashamed if somehow my words did anything to incite this violence. Leno's apology coinciding with a major reckoning in the Asian American community. People are being very angry now. They feel like they've been betrayed. They feel like they played by the rules. And this is how they get treated by fellow Americans. So there's been a, a real reawakening of Asian Americans and what it means to be Asian in this country. Our thanks to Zoreen for that. It's still ahead here on Prime. The royal fallout from a suit lobbed by Meghan and Harry and how it's forcing one company to file for bankruptcy. The nation that will allow women to take leave if they have a miscarriage. And our conversation with the first black sheriff of Wyoming coming up. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. 
Welcome back. We are tracking several international headlines at this hour, including a major bottleneck along the Suez Canal that began after a massive cargo ship was blown sideways during a sandstorm. Now the incident is disrupting global commerce to the tune of $9 billion. That's $9 billion a day of deliveries being disrupted. More than 150 ships are waiting for the situation to be resolved as dredgers and tugboats furiously work. When will it end? Israel may be heading toward its fifth election after Prime Minister Netanyahu and his right-wing allies failed again to win a parliamentary majority. It's the fourth election in just two years and another stinging rebuke for Bibi, who is finding it as difficult to form a coalition as his opposition is finding it tough to beat him. And the bold move by New Zealand's lawmakers to offer paid leave for workers who suffer miscarriage. The motion was unanimously approved and employees will be entitled to three days leave after miscarriage once it passes as expected in that nation's parliament. India is the only other nation that provides something similar. Next, to the big legal victory for Meghan and Harry in their endless battle with tabloids, Deb Roberts has more on how one paparazzi company, Meghan sued, is now filing for bankruptcy. The tabloids may be rethinking their aggressive efforts to get exclusive photos of big celebrities. Meghan Markle's ongoing legal battle against Splash News, a major blow. The paparazzi giant citing it as one of the main reasons it's filing for bankruptcy. Saying, in part, if the legal action were to be successful, Splash would be liable to pay her legal bills, which are sizable. Having tried unsuccessfully to reach a settlement with the Duchess, this places an unacceptable risk to the survival of the business. And they were doing very well, but the world around them has changed, right? The magazines have suffered huge newsstand losses. Social media has grown. So all of these things are conspiring against them. The Meghan Markle lawsuit may be the final you know, nail in the coffin for Splash, but I think they were drowning anyway. It's been a year-long legal battle. Megan suing for breach of privacy over photos taken of her and baby Archie in Vancouver. Just the latest chapter in Megan and Harry's crusade against the tabloids. In February, she won a case against the publisher of The Mail on Sunday over publication of a letter she wrote to her estranged father. A judge ruling her privacy was invaded. After filing that lawsuit in 2019, an emotional Megan sharing her pain in an ITV documentary. I never thought that this would be easy, but I thought it would be fair. And that's the part that's really hard to reconcile. A recent report for Byline Investigates also saying that when Meghan and Harry started dating, the son hired a private investigator who dug up details on her personal life, including her social security number. A spokeswoman for the Duchess of Sussex saying in a statement, this investigative report shows that the predatory practices of days past are still ongoing, reaping irreversible damage for families and relationships. The couple sharing their frustrations with Oprah, accusing the British tabloids of racist coverage. From the beginning of our relationship, they were so attacking and inciting so much racism really mm -hmm. I mean, it changed our the risk level there'll definitely be quiet celebrations going on between the sussexes they've really wanted to create a safer environment to raise their family in the u.s and being able to eliminate some of the threats of the paparazzi will certainly create that environment that they're looking to build the issue and the battle extremely personal for harry whose mother diana was killed in a car crash after being chased by paparazzi Everything that she went through and what happened to her is incredibly raw every single day. And that's not me being paranoid. That's just me not wanting a repeat of, of the past. Our thanks to Deb for that. As the conversation around policing practices in our country continues, change is slowly happening in some parts of the country. The state of Wyoming, so for example, many. officially has its I first black sheriff in its history. 39-year-old Sheriff Aaron Applehands, and Sheriff Applehands joins us now. Thank you so much for being here, and congratulations on your history-making appointment. I'd like to start out with just the idea of being in law enforcement isn't something that you always considered, it sounds like. Tell us what led you down the path to ultimately protect and serve? I, uh, I was kind of recruited into law enforcement. Uh, I really wasn't thinking about getting into it about a decade ago. And uh, chief of police at the time uh, at the university where I was working came by and said, hey, I think you'd be good for law enforcement. Um, I was working in college recruiting and 
college counseling and says you, you do well talking with people and working with people and so I can teach you all the things you need to know about law enforcement but I can't always teach everybody how to how to talk and, and interact with people so um, recruited me to come on and I was looking to you know do a little bit of a career change where I could be more hands-on in terms of helping out my community and serving and so it was a it was a good match one that I didn't see coming but a good match nonetheless and now there is a new sheriff in town and I'd like to get a sense from you as well with the ongoing police involved shootings that we've seen uh, one that even involved uh, your own predecessor that led to him stepping down uh, where do you see the opportunities for law enforcement to change their approach when dealing with the public while also trying to keep themselves safe from bad actors I definitely think we have a, a, a big opportunity um, to not only change the way we police, um, the way we interact with our community, but still remain safe um, and still provide law enforcement services and safety to our community. Um, I think if you get into you know, kind of a single-handed approach, either where you're heavy-handed with your public or you're completely hands-off with your public, it creates more, you know, more issues than it solves. And so I definitely think that there's a, there's a balance to it. And if you don't mind, I'd like for you to share with us some of your own experiences prior to carrying a badge that you may have had uh, with police kind of encounters that you may have personally experienced that, that perhaps you see molding you as a sheriff now. I had members of my extended family um, have interactions with the police in other states um, and had seen how how they were treated. I've had um, extended you know family members um, you know also be involved in in other other legal matters that involved in the in the police, whether that be um, you know. Uh, gangs or drugs or uh, you know, other crimes as well. And so a lot of that um, kind of shaped me growing up in terms of seeing um, not only kind of the human side, uh, you know, on the, on the back end of that criminal justice system of the, you know, the people that are going through it and the things that they have to go through, but then also getting into law enforcement and, and seeing, you know, kind of the, the front side of it in terms of enforcing the law and, and, you know, trying to provide safety for everybody. So it's, it's molded me quite a bit to where in the position that I'm in, uh, I, I'm always cognizant of both sides. Right, a dual consciousness, if you will, that you're able to bring to the job. Often being the first comes with a, a, a lot of responsibility. Um, what are some of the pressures that you feel personally in this role, and do you have the necessary support and structure needed to succeed? I, I basically feel two two major pressures. The first part is just the job itself, making sure that I come in and and do what I set out to do, get the things accomplished that I wanted to do, you know, really make a, a good name for the department, serve the community. And then the second thing is being the the you know the first black sheriff, kind of being the first of my kind here in the state, and that there's not a whole lot of other law enforcement officers that are kind of in my position and look like me, make sure that I hold that door open behind me, create opportunities for people that either want to follow my footsteps or mimic some of the things that, that I'm doing as well. Sheriff Applehands, once again, congratulations. Thanks so much for talking with us tonight. Thank you, I appreciate the time. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and good night. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime.